Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing today? You guys doing all right? You having a good time? My name is Jeff. I'm the president of the San Diego Marine Aquarium Society. We are the host of, for MACNA this year, so. We really appreciate you guys coming out. It's been a, a good week so far, so I hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. With all that said, it is my pleasure to announce our next speaker, Ramon Villaverde from the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. Thank you. Thanks everyone uh, for coming out. Um, I'm going to be talking about small scale aquaculture. Uh, some of the things you see, I mean, you could apply this to your doing it at home and doing it ghetto if need be and uh, repurposing things. But uh, so I hope you enjoy. Uh, this is I'm going to overview. Uh, I'm going to talk about space and equipment, what's needed and what's available. Uh, live foods, what's available needed for live foods, brood stock. Uh, collection from an exhibit, since we work at a, work at a public aquarium. Uh, larval systems to grow out the fish and invertebrates and uh, juvenile grouts. Other considerations, and then I'm going to show some results of all the stuff I've been able to rear up at the zoo. So, start with algae culture. You've got to start from the beginning of the food chain. I hate culturing algae, but it's a necessary evil. Uh, it's the biggest time consumer, really, to do any kind of aquaculture work for me, I think, for anyone. Um, you need it to culture the plankton to feed your fish and some invertebrate larvae, and need, need it to add turbidity to uh, larval systems. It's been known that uh, some larval, lar fish larvae like the water turbid um, to be happy and thriving. Uh, I'll show you some examples of how some other public aquariums culture their algae. Uh, these are thin-walled fiberglass tubes at uh, North Carolina Fisher Aquarium. Long Island Aquarium, they also use thin-walled fiberglass tubes, just a little bit different, narrower and taller. Um, Central Campus is a high school in Iowa uh, run by Kirk Embry, Embry, and it's a marine biology class, and uh, he cultures his algae and glass carboys you can get for uh, brewing beer. So, good old repurpose. And actually, Henry Dorley Zoo, um, Tim Morsey, um, he also cultures his algae in these one gallon jugs. Um, at the Columbus Zoo, I repurpose water jugs, two liter bottles, and pretzel jars, and all menagerie of different plastic containers. We have a lot of zoo, uh, kids that come through the zoo and they go through a lot of pretzels and cookies and their programs so uh, it's an easy way for repurpose. I'm kind of on a limited, limited to no budget so um, that's why I kind of repurpose a lot of things um, but yeah so. Um, total volume algae I have actually on hand is way more than I really need. I have almost 49 gallons of algae. Um, I only use about a gallon a day to, do, to feed my live foods and if I have a lot of larval systems going, I use about two gallons. And then, depending on some other factors, I might use another one to three gallons in, in that day. And as you can see in the background, like the bottles, there are different stages. So some have just been restarted, some are a few days old. Uh, the real dark ones are, are ready to be used and, and fed out. Uh, algae culture support area and time. Uh, that's my footprint for for, for the algae cultures and, and sports space. Um, the time varies four to five days a week, uh, and it takes me about 15 to 45 minutes, depending on how much algae I need to break down and reset. Um, usually it takes longer for doing the big five gallon jugs. Um, Why it's four to five days is I don't like doing the algae, so I kind of have it staggered where it's, I don't need to touch them, and, except for feeding it out to the copepods. And, I, and it also minimizes me needing to uh, have my, co-workers pick up my, uh, to do my work on my weekends, so. Uh, this is just the same picture, so that vat right there underneath the stairs is where I fit in a, a saltwater vat, and that's strictly for my algae cultures. Um, if you try to do algae cultures, it's important to keep as clean as water as possible. Um, if, if it gets contaminated with bacteria or another type of algae, uh, you won't be successful in culturing algae. Um, so I have a dedicated vat for that. Um, that green, and then there's miscellaneous equipment in that, on that back wall, 
with another um, hose line that supplies uh, salt water for, for my uh, plankton in a sink. Um, so when I reset the algae cultures, I'll usually reset a two liter bottle and, and then I'll reset a five gallon jug. Uh, I used a two part fertilizer and the little beaker and the, and the measuring cup are the amounts of algae that I, I uh, use to actually reset. So I'll take a sample of the algae that's ready to be harvested and I'll use 40, 40 mils to restart the, the um, two liter bottles and then I'll use about a liter to reset my five gallon jugs. So the, what I'm really doing the algae for, as I said, is to raise uh, the live foods, which are the copepods. Um, I also have rotifers on hand, but I don't actually use them a whole lot besides feeding to some of my coral systems. Uh, the main copepod that I have in large production are, are parvocaunus, and then recently in the last year I've picked up uh, apocyclops and neutropena. Uh, the parvo is the one on the right, and the um, apocyclops is in the middle, and neutropena is on the top, top left. Is that So here's a zero day post hatch. It just hatched out that morning. Um, the larvae that we're working with are really underdeveloped. Um, their eyes aren't developed. They don't have a stomach yet. Um, they're still surviving off that little oil glob that's, that's right there. So these are the adult copepods, and then there's the uh, nopli eye. Um, so after two to three days, depending on the fish, all their, their eyes are going to form, and their stomach will form, and they'll have a functional mouth, and then they'll start eating. So as you can see, they're not going to be able to fit this big guy in, the, in his mouth, so they're actually going to be feeding on, on the nopli eye. So how some other facilities do some live cultures? Um, this is North Carolina again. Uh, they're just culturing brine shrimp in there. Um, they also have these semi-square uh, uh, tubs. Uh, they're, they're culturing rotifers, and they have a nice sign on there to say, make sure you harvest from buckets, or from this bucket. Um, usually when you're doing live food cultures, you have certain things, especially rotifers. You don't want rotifers anywhere near your, your copepods, because they'll eventually contaminate them, and then the rotifers will outcompete the copepods, and it's a pain. I've had to actually s separate by pipetting copepods out to get another pure strain of just copepods. Um, and then you have to ramp it back up, and it takes a lot of time, and it's not fun. But I culture my copepods in five-gallon buckets, and these uh, buckets just sit underneath the, uh, where my algae culture is. And I also culture the rotifer buckets on, and, and some other buckets that are on the other side of the room. Uh, as I said, I picked up some, some of the other types of copepods. These are just about four liters of, uh, uh, it's a food container. So it's real small. I only have about two and a half liters of water in each of those containers, and I just kind of keep them going. If I needed to ramp them up, if I wanted to try to feed them some fish larvae, I'll just put them in a bucket and then start ramping up the, the production. Um, with all the, all the stuff I have going on back there, I have a chart, a dry erase board to keep track of what needs maintained. Um, if you don't have that, if you're gonna, well, if you're working at a public aquarium, you don't have that, you're gonna have a, a nightmare on your hands. Um, but this is just to kind of keep, us, uh, keep me organized, as well as my coworkers. Um, couple broad and for space, uh, you can see there, it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. Um, Time-wise, seven days a week, um, I feed the cultures once a day. Um, seven days a week, I, I um, one of the couple pod buckets and one of the rotifer buckets are reset, which means I Break, I completely pour out that bucket into a strainer. I harvest the copepods, and then I'll use a portion of that copepods to feed out to the fish larvae, or, and then I'll use a portion to reset the bucket. Um, sometimes when I don't have fish larvae, I'll just feed them to my other uh, aquariums that I have. Uh, total time, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, most of the time, it's just resetting the buckets. Feeding out only takes a few minutes each. Um, each bucket filled to two and a half. Yet, oh, here you go. Uh, each bucket is only filled up to about two and a half gallons. The one on the left is one that was fed yesterday and it hasn't been fed yet this morning, uh, in the morning. And the one on the right is one that's fed. So the one on the left I'd harvest. And this is what I collect. 
So a lot of different specs. Um, sometimes the cultures get contaminated and there'll be nothing in the water column. So that's bad and then I'll have to reset a bucket. Uh, from a, I have to collect a sample from a different bucket and, and reset it. And then I won't have any live foods for the fish larvae, so that could be bad also. To do a lot of the screening work um, and to look at samples to see how my cultures are, I use various micron screens, uh, bottle to rinse stuff down. Uh, that's a plankton wheel down there in the left corner that a friend made um, to observe the, if I wanted to do counts. And then various micro microscope slides to uh, look at them underneath the scope. So we don't do brood stock tanks at, at the Columbus Zoo. I don't have uh, the space right now. Um, this is just an example of brood stock tanks. I'm sure some people have fish rooms that have brood stock. Um, to raise clownfish. This is Roger Williams University. Um, so I don't know how much time it takes. Uh, you know, it depends on the species you're working with, how, how big of a system you need to do, uh, maintain to keep them, and, and time-wise, that's all going to factor in to how much maintenance and feeding you're going to have to be doing uh, seven days a week. Uh, at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, uh, we collect from a 85,000 gallon mul uh, mixed species exhibit. Um, it's artificial coral. Um, artificial salt water, um, but we have a, a large collect, oops, it forwarded accidentally. It, um, it has a, most, we, I do most of my egg collection from, from this exhibit. I do have a few other exhibits where there are animals that are breeding, um, so, so, some damsels, and they are benthic egg layers, so I have to, they lay on display, and being a display, you can't have any kind of object that doesn't look nice or pretty. So yeah, um, I had a, there, there was some damsels that were laying in a, a big conch shell. And so I took some two-part epoxy and I made a, a cast of it and the cast was removable. So um, you can see down here on the bottom right here that these are multiple clutches of eggs that have been laid on, on, on the thing. So I can pull out the shell, take that cast out, put the eggs in my larval tank and then put the uh, put the egg sh uh, conch shell back in with a new mold or just leave it bare. Um, so so th those are some of the eggs in that picture there. Um, I didn't, haven't had any real success with these guys. I've only gotten to a few days. Um, but as I said, most of the uh, collection I do, I do from uh, egg collectors. And you can make them in various sizes and with various material. Uh, this is just a little reptile keeper that I made. Um, it works on a simple airlift design. Um, so uh, I might have another picture, but so what you do is the, you have a bulkhead in the center of your, your container. You have screens so water can flow back out, but it'll trap whatever your you, plankton or larvae or eggs that uh, have been spawned in your tank. And there's an airline that goes down the center and it bubbles, and that bubble draws water from the top, top of the uh, pipe and it draws it down into the collector. So in the morning, I usually set them in the evening, and then in the morning, uh, we harvest the eggs. Here's a larger version uh, that we put in our large tank. Uh, same, same thing, just a larger version. Here you can see from a top view of the airline with the bubbling down in the middle, and then it, it skims the eggs right here. So it's really passive. I don't collect everything that's getting spawned. Um, we could do, it's kind of difficult how our filtration set up. So the fish are spawning out here in, in, in the tank and then everything gets drawn to our skimmer, and, which goes to our filtration. So I'm just passively collecting everything that kind of goes by right here. Um, I have plans to do some modifications so I can actually collect a lot more, but I collect about four to five mils a day. Sometimes we'll get 20 plus mils. I can't do much with any more than five mils. So. Um, I don't, it's not a huge deal. But so we set, them, we set the collectors in the evening, uh, right before we leave for work, and then in the morning, we pull them out. And you can see right here, there's masses of eggs that have collected along with a lot of other debris. So I rinse those into another screen, and then I have to start the cleanup process. Um, we developed this uh, process for cleaning to start, uh, when we got uh, involved with rising tide. So when we were sending eggs down to Eric, um, I kind of just, try to figure out methods of how, how the hell do I get rid of all this crap right here. So the first part is I 
rubber band, a window screen, and screen out all the large material, collected that, and you still have a lot of this other nasty detritus with them and bad eggs. So a really easy method is to put them in a beaker and give them a little spin, whirl, to kind of get rid of any bubbles that might be attached to anything. Then you give that about 10 minutes, and you get a nice clear water, all the bad eggs and debris settles down to the bottom, and then you have a nice layer of viable eggs. It takes about five or 10 minutes for, for that to happen. And then you just decant the viable eggs. You have nice clean eggs down there. Uh, here's a picture of all those eggs uh, underneath, underneath the microscope. So you can see there's lots of different types of eggs. Um, I haven't keyed out to ID all these eggs, um, and it's random of what we get. Um, some fish spawn continuously throughout the year. Some probably do seasonal. Um, our light, our temperature stays constant throughout the year, but our light levels change because of uh, holiday events. So um, a lot of the fish that I've raised, or the angel fish that I've raised, are uh, they usually spawn around January, February, right after our lights have been on till 10 o'clock at night because we have a uh, holiday lights, um, and they go back down to a normal 12 and 12 cycle. Um, but but I'm starting to work on on keying these out. So after they collected, we, I, I measured it just to see how much uh, we collect. As I said, typical is about two to five mils. Sometimes we'll get, get larger, larger collection, but I don't have any use for them. Uh, sometimes I'll hatch them out and they'll actually be, just be extra live feed for my coral systems. So, um, One thing that I started to do later on in the larval thing, because of contaminants that I'll talk about later in a little bit, um, is we'd sterilize the eggs to get rid of any bad bacteria and ciliates, and there'll be uh, copopod, or amphipods and whatnot that are in, collected with them. So I want to kill those off and just put nice clean eggs in the larval tank so um, nothing nasty might uh, accidentally gets into the larval rearing tank. So we sterilize them with a 1% iodine solution of one mil per liter for about 10 minutes. So the whole time, it takes to, to do the, that whole process. It's about five minutes to set up the collectors, 15 minutes in the morning to uh, do the separation. Uh, so the total time is about 30 minutes every, every day to do the process. So after you have the eggs, you've got to rear up the fish, so, or at least attempt to. Uh, there's a lot of dead fish that go on. So. But it's always fun to tinker. And this is Central Campus, the high school again. And they've made some pseudo chrysals in a 10 gallon tank with a cutout bucket. They used the old school fish bowl that they cut a hole in and just air bubbled to uh, raise some seahorses there. So uh, um, I've talked to Kirk a lot and he likes, he, he, he has his kids do some, some really amazing stuff uh, on low budget as well. Um, we were fortunate enough to be involved with a project called uh, IMLS project that was started by Roger Williams University in New England Aquarium. And uh, so a lot of public aquarists across the country participated in the, uh, several workshops, and all the participants were lucky enough to get larval rearing tanks. So everyone had do, uh, the same rearing setup to attempt to raise fish out of their, out of their aquarium. So um, this is, was a really nice uh, bonus, and this kind of really jump-started uh, my, my, re my rearing efforts. Um, Omaha also was part of the uh, workshop, one of the workshops, and they have their larval tanks in here. So, you know, the workshops we learned about doing larval rearing, um, how to set things up, what to look for, and then they sent you a whole uh, larval rearing kit, and you just had to put it together. And everyone's, as you can see, is a little bit different. Uh, Omaha did a water bath. Their, their systems are in an area that has really big temperature fluctuations. So if you have an area that has, you know, that's not consistent temperature, you can have a water bath that is heated and stays at a constant temperature to keep your larvae at a constant temperature. Um, at the Columbus Zoo, uh, before I got the molar systems, I went out to Walmart and bought a rubber tote. Um, same purpose as a black round tub. Um, you know, cut some holes in it and it's a larval tank. So uh, I also raised some things and plastic jars because that's what I had and I wanted to see what I could do with it. Um, so um, that's just about six liters and then these are uh, just pop bottles that I repurposed. 
uh, inverted, and I raised some, in, uh, some uh, snails in them. So larval system space and time. Uh, time varies daily. Basic task of, is, takes five to 10 minutes. Weekly to biweekly system maintenance takes about 30 to 45 minutes. So um, all these timelines that I've been giving, it's kind of really important because my job doesn't revolve around rearing fish. My job revolves around taking care of everything in the aquarium. Um, so, you know, that's doing I don't know, a dozen or so different aquariums and having to maintain them all to, to uh, certain standards. So um, I have to fit this in. Under, kind, of, kind, of, kind of started under the radar. Um, and then I actually started rearing stuff. And then I said, hey, yeah, you, here, I have fish that we need to get rid of. And uh, then you go, well, how much time are you taking to do this? And you're like, well, it was justified. So, um, But this is usually the basic routines that's done every day. Um, visual checks, resetting the algae drips, siphoning the bottom. Uh, resetting the algae drips, so we add algae to the larval tanks. Uh, so, and they're dripped in, they're not just poured in. You just don't pour a whole amount of algae in there. So it's slowly dripped in. Um, and then obviously there's gonna be waste material building up, so you have to siphon the bottom. There are screens that help keep the plankton and the larvae in, so they get clogged up because they're really fine and then feeding the systems with copepods, and then certain times you get, with the algae, you'll get a surface scum on the water, so you have to clean that off. Um, so, and then, once again, you have weekly and bi-weekly maintenance of like doing big water changes on the system. So here's so one of the screens. This one's been in the tank for a day or so, um, and this one's just replaced. So you can see around here, this, these, these are, in the center of the tank, there's a bulkhead at the bottom, and they just screw in. Uh, these ring, these are air rings, and they slowly. You, you can uh, it has we have a valve on the top, and you can have really high flow or low flow. Uh, the amount of flow just depends on what you're trying to rear and and, and how the fish larvae behave. Um, it's kind of different for everything, and I'm still learning on what's working and what doesn't. This video is uh, just showing, if you can look at the air, uh, removing the surface. Whoop, why'd it stop? Uh-oh, sorry. So th all this video is showing is uh, removing uh, the scum off the water. And the easy way to do that is we had just, I did it again, sorry is to uh, use a paper towel, and you'll notice the airflow, maybe. See how it's kind of just, just staying in the center? Once you remove that surface scum, uh, it, the air will flow uh, nice, uh, nicely across the entire top surface. Uh, this is kind of important to keep the, some fish larvae, they get kind of stuck to that surfactant on the top. Um, and it it's also lowers your oxygen exchange. So um, this is done on a, on a as-needed basis. So after you raise the fish, uh, you got to think about room for grow out. Um, I'm always looking for space. And this little five and a half gallon is actually a grow out because these guys were all these guys were in a six liter jug. Um, these are uh, French grunts. Um, they eventually, get, I had other clutches that I raised in some molar tanks uh, that had to be moved into some larger, and I used uh, some unused quarantine tanks, which are six foot rounds. So other considerations, uh, I was talking about contaminants in food and the, larva, the larvae cultures, um, other miscellaneous support, equi uh, support equipment that you need, and for us, we have to do a lot of documentation. Uh, this is important for us rearing the fish so we know what's been working and what hasn't been working. And then planning, you know, I'd, I'd try to raise every, anything and everything that kind of spawns, um, but uh, sometimes I don't, we don't have a way, we have to eventually either keep them on, 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 on exhibit or put them on exhibit or uh, surplus them out to other AZA facilities. And sometimes uh, I flooded the market one year, so. Um. But contaminants. Uh, so these guys are nasty. They kind of come from the actual aquarium systems where we collect the eggs. Uh, originally, when I was collecting eggs, I was collecting
collecting them and putting them right in the larval tanks. Uh, that was a bad idea because I also collected some hydroids. And they grew because you're feeding live uh, food. Um, lots of nice uh, free supply of food that's supposed to be for the fish larvae, but they eat it. Um, this is just the Medusa stage of a hydroid. Um, here's a picture of a dead angelfish with a hydroid next to it, and then there's the, either the body of the hydroid. They kind of grow on the side, they kind of grow on all the surface areas, um, and then when they have medu their medusa today to reproduce. Uh, so when the medusas are swimming around, they're obviously stinging the larvae. Some, I, I don't know if they actually eat some of the newer larvae, but I'm assuming they might. Um, and then other issues we have, uh, these are contaminants with uh, live food is vorticella. They're a little stock ciliate. And uh, this was an issue mostly with when I was raising some harlequin shrimp. Uh, but you can see all these ciliates on the eye stock. Um, I'm just assuming that it was hindering their molting. Because uh, as the larvae grow, they have to continually molt. Uh, I was getting a lot of die off um, when I didn't expect to have any die off. So I look, looked at them underneath the scope, and these are what I found. So to clean up, I just had to stop doing um, algae drips did some big water changes and scrubs, and it kind of got them under control. And then when you have to screen stuff, you have a little menagerie of different size screens, some homemade, some are commercially bought. Um, they're used to separate out uh, different size copepods and other, other food items, uh, and collect the eggs. Uh, we also have a Sedgwick slide so we can measure how big the fish larvae are. I also have a little cover slip that has a little micron uh, measurement on there as well. Uh, to increase with documentation and, and kind of keeping track of what's working and what's not, I, I bought these little hobos. They read out uh, the t uh, light sensor and then they also keep track of temperature. So I can put them in there with the larval run and see what, if I have any major changes overnight uh, with, with building temperatures because I don't have uh, heaters on, on the systems. It's all ambient and uh, I can compare them to other ones. And so I keep track of all that. With, I made an Excel file with little drop downs. And you can see there are all different types of parameters uh, that I look at to see how the larvae are behaving. So I can document it, and then I go back and look. If we had a big die off at a certain time, like what were we doing? And then we can change it up later on. Um, other documentation is doing photo, photo documentation. So this is my setup. Uh, I bought an adapter for my, for my camera here, and then have a flash ring and then adapters for the microscope mounts. And then I have a little control so I can remotely take pictures. Um, if you try to take pictures by pressing the actual camera, it's too much vibration and, and you'll get blurry pictures. Uh, this is my setup. So it's not really made to have camera. So I have to take out the eyepiece and, and put in that adapter. Uh, I rubber band the, the flash ring. Um, and then I just, when I have bigger fish, I swap it out on, onto, onto there. And, my friend also, George, made a, this mount for my camera, or for my flash ring to be able to take uh, pictures underneath the uh, dissecting scope. And then these are all the little support equipment to do all the microscope, microscope work. Um, this is also a picture for equipment that I use. Uh, there's MS-222. Um, I actually kill the larvae to be able to take pictures of them. Um, little probes so I can move, position things. Uh, and you probably wonder why there's personal lubricant. Um, so when I was raising um, peppermint shrimp, uh, they have these really nice appendages. And if you try to take a picture of them, it's all, they all just collapse on themselves. So I figured, I figured to thicken up the salt water, and it keeps all the filaments suspended, and you can get nice, nice pictures that way. So. Um, so it was a lot of trial and error to get consistency, but uh, that's what the personal lubricant's for. I uh, also have different type screens I put over the light to get different uh, effects in the pictures. Um, these are just old CD cases, and then this is uh, just a color, color film. So here's a, just an example of taking it up with that blue film on the, uh, underneath the, on the light on the microscope uh, with the flash ring. And then these two are the same fish larvae. Um, just with, with the different backgrounds. So another invaluable tool is a GoPro. Um, 
you know, it's kind of hard to see what's going on with the fish larvae while they're in their tanks um, to actually see, you know, how they're behaving. Um, so I had a GoPro and I bought a macro lens and then a, a good flash, uh, good light as well. Um, different various camera mounts depending on how, what kind of shot I want to try to get and then have other support lights to do certain things. And so here's the kind of the setup. This is actually in the larval tank. You can see that's the, the center standpipe. Um, I have two cameras here. One has the macro lens on it and one just has just regular uh, without the lens. And then you can see a, a flashlight there and then a light there. Um, I also have uh, little containers to uh, take the larvae out and try to get some other uh, different video shots. Um, and then I made a little photo booth um, and a stand to, uh, to do some video work. And here is some video of a fish larvae eating. So right where that little guy is right there, um, I slow it down, about 15% speed. And right, there. So they kind of curl up their tail and then they just lunge out at, at, the, at their prey. So it was kind of pretty neat. Um, I plan on kind of doing a little bit more work and seeing what else I can, what else I can get out of that. So now I'm going to show you some results of some of the stuff that we, I cultured. Um, I said we collected initially for rising tide and a nice thing about sending them to a university and them doing their research is they did some genetics on the eggs and, and larvae that they received from us. So these are all the known fish that are reproducing in my tank. Um, the ones I had most success with are, are angelfish. Um, I'm not quite sure what they are because we have all these. Uh, these top four I have pairs of and these last two are just single individuals. But here are some different stages, ages of uh, some of the angelfish, up to 35 days. Around 35 days, uh, they start getting a bar, and they, they kind of they settle out and act like a, a normal fish. Um, here are some that are 18 days. These are some that I raised in the jar. Um, these are 73-day-old that I put in a, a, a grow-out system. And then 104 days, they get really nice and colorful. And then by the, at this stage, I'm usually trying to ship them out to other facilities. Um, some of the interesting things that we learn while we're, we're doing the larva culture, uh, we have like the black round tubs and we have white round tubs. Um, you can see that the black round tub ones, they're a lot bigger, more robust than the 10 day old. Um, they're really skinny, so um, they don't like the white round tubs. So I stopped using the white round tubs for the, for the cultures and, and just strictly use uh, the black bottomed tanks. This is video of, of fish larvae in a pretzel jar. And you can see there's mul so there are multiple species. There's uh, some uh, tang larvae and some other larvae in there as well. But those little black ones are the angelfish larvae. And then the rest of the video that plays. And that, that line on the side was just a rigid airline that's slowly bubbling for circulation. This is in a molar system. Uh, 11 days old. Uh, at certain stages, they become really phototoxic, and they're actually really they'll group they're grouping together to go into my my, my dive light. These are 45 days old. Um, I'm about to move them to uh, move them into their grow out system that you saw in the previous picture. So with the angels, these are the numbers of angelfish are reared. Um, they seem to spawn kind of throughout the year, uh, with spring and summer, or winter and spring kind of being the most most active. Um, uh, other things raised is uh, peppermint shrimp. Um, I did this several years ago, and this is where I was talking about where they get really big uh, filaments, like to be able to take pictures of. So I missed that. That's what the personal lubricants for to get them thickened up, and they actually stay suspended in the water. So it takes about 
24 days to get peppermint shrimp to settle. Uh, they, sell, they sell out about one centimeter. Uh, when I initially started to try to raise peppermint shrimp, they were going up to 100 and some days before I would get any settlement. So you know, a lot of that factors into nutritional value and water quality. So I learned as I go. Um, when I do maintenance in my coral exhibits, sometimes I'll get invertebrates to spawn in the system. Uh, so we have rock boring urchins, and this is a male releasing sperm. And so there's some development, the, L's, uh, the eggs dividing, and then the different stages. As they get older, they get longer appendages. And then as when they settle out, they lose all those long appendages. Uh, the green is the algae that the, that um, urgent larvae ate. Uh, we have flame cardinals or a mouth brooder. I, would, I, was gonna, I was thinking that this would be fairly easy since Bengai cardinals are kind of easy. Um, but they're actually pretty difficult to rear. Uh, that male holds about 15,000 eggs in its mouth. The reason why I know is I had my, uh, my uh, intern do count. Uh, and it took her four days to actually do the count. And we, I, was, I was thinking it was going to be about four, four or 5,000 eggs. And I was pretty shocked when we came like with 12 to 15,000 eggs in there. So uh, the male doesn't eat for, for the entire time that it's holding the eggs. And it'll hold the eggs for about four, four to five days before they actually hatch out. Um, the difficult part is getting the larvae from the male, getting the eggs from the male, and actually getting them to grow out and, and, and rearing them. Um, but we, I did get about a half dozen to settle out at around 32 days. Uh, we raised harlequin shrimp. Uh, I didn't actually have the adult pair of harlequin shrimp. There was a, a local store, well, a store that was a couple hours away from me. Uh, he contacted me. He had a pair that was continuously reproducing. Um, I was able to acquire about 850 uh, larvae from them, and then we uh, reared them up, and then I, got, I also got a, a second batch from them. Uh, but they settled out around 52 days. This is a, just a picture with an, without any magnification, uh, just with a normal camera, and this is underneath a dissecting scope. And I have some neat video here. So this is in the larval rearing tank. Um, the molars, they didn't really work that well for a lot of inverts, but the harlequin shrimp uh, didn't really care. Uh, so those are the larvae swimming around the top. But if you look down at that bottom, you see that little Asterina starfish. Um, there's a settled uh, shrimp down there. So um, you'll, I have another clip that it fades into here in a minute. Oh, oh sorry. Go back. So the, everything that I've been, I, I raised, I raised on the parvo, parvo colonist copepods. Um, you can see what, the, what that shrimp to the right, and the starfish, and then the larvae that are still planktonic. So once they settle, they have to eat starfish. Uh, so I was harvesting about 50 to 80 starfish every three to four days out of my coral systems. Uh, and, and I had depleted the, the stock after about four months because uh, I couldn't surplus the, the, the shrimp fast enough. Uh, so I eventually had to actually, I talked my bosses into ordering some starfish to feed. And it takes, a, it takes them about a week and a half to two weeks to actually eat a full grown starfish. So that was kind of neat to see. Um, here's some older harlequins shot with a GoPro and a macro lens. It's kind of cruel. They fight. So the big one's a female, and the smaller ones are the, are the males. They're also a little bit different in age as well. Uh, so that female is going to protect it, and the other one's going to come in and try to, try to take it away, and then there's, a, then there's a, a fight. So I have had, they had some issues when they were competing for food, and they ripped each other's claws off. So um, I kind of made sure they were well fed. <laughs> so 
So yeah, just in a second here, oh, it gets real agitated. One gets turned upside down, and then they have a little fight and they swim off. Um, so since I was raising harlequin shrimp, I was like, oh, it'd be great to actually have a, a food source. Uh, we actually have starfish for our touch pool tank. Uh, I was able to get them to spawn. It was due to uh, transitioning from our, we actually pull everything off our touch pool exhibit and put them in a back holding. And there's a temperature and salinity difference sometimes, and that will get, uh, induce them to spawn. So I had them spawn, and I, I put them in some jars, and I tried to raise them up. But I was only able to get them to about 54 days. Uh, someone told me it was a nutritional issue or maybe a chemical cue to, to settlement. So that ABBA thing might be, is interesting for me. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to have an opportunity to try these again. Um, but I had success with turbo snails. Everyone has turbo snails in their tank, right? Um, you, you can induce them the same way with a, a, a different in temperature. Um, they're nice and blue when they're one day, and then they'll settle out in four days. So um, I raised 300 some in two two liter bottles. So it doesn't take up a whole lot of space to do it. Uh, French grunts, these aren't really popular. They're not really good fish for the hobbyist, but uh, they're great for public displays and Caribbean uh, displays. Uh, so these are the eggs, and then there's uh, 37 days post-hatch. I have a little bit of video. This video was shot when they were about 17 days. Uh, after raising the other stuff, these things were actually like raising guppies. But uh, the thing is, they're eating machines, so um, it took a lot of food to, to, to raise them up. So actually, after about 17 days, I transitioned them over to 24-hour Artemia. So with the grunts, these are the numbers of grunts I've had with the runs. Um, I stopped trying to rear them because uh, we didn't, didn't have any need to. Uh, the ones that we raised have all been put in our manatee exhibit. Uh, so we have, a stock, we have a nice full tank of, of, of French grunts. So other things, uh, these are all from the main tank, uh, are things that I have not been successful with or limited success. So I've been told that's a butterfly fish. This is a banner fish, and then uh, with the recent news of, of rising tide raising tangs, the yellow and the blues, uh, I got excited because uh, I got these guys to uh, 15 days. So I listened to all their talks and, and, and gotten that information, so hopefully, eventually, I'll be doing the same thing in, in, in Columbus. Um, these, you know, all this has been made possible by, you know, doing the, doing the research and being able to participate with uh, Marine Breeders Initiative, uh, the Laval Culture Project that uh, was hosted by uh, Roger Williams University, and my involvement with the Rising Tide Project. So with that, I'd like to thank you.